I invite you this evening to turn to 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. We're going to be looking this evening at the last portion of chapter 3, beginning in verse 10. 2 Timothy chapter 3, beginning in verse 10. How would you like to be remembered? I'm not trying to be morbid or suggesting that I know something you don't. (laughs) The truth is, we're not going to be in this world forever. And when the time comes when we're not, how do you want to be remembered? What do you want your legacy to be? Now, you might think, well, that's out of my hands. I mean, I can't control what other people think or say about me, especially when I'm gone. And that is true to an extent, yet it's also true that the way we live today will weigh mightily in the minds of those and how we are remembered tomorrow. Now, when writing this book that we call 2 Timothy, which is actually a letter, Paul was coming to the end of his earthly life, and he knew it. We get into chapter 4, and he's going to make it very clear, my days are numbered. The end is near. And this letter, while hoping to reach Timothy in time for him to come to Paul before the apostle was gone, was written to encourage Timothy how to carry on after Paul had left this life. Now, the first nine verses of 2 Timothy chapter 3, we looked at last week, and they paint a pretty bleak picture. He starts off by saying there will be terrible times in the last days. And then he goes on to describe what really sounds pretty familiar, (laughs) things that have been going on really ever since his time, even to our own day. It just seems to be amping up more and more. And by the time we get to verse 9, things are looking pretty dark. But when we get to verse 10, we see a change. We see Paul telling Timothy, now, I told you how things are going to be, and I told you how people are going to be. Now I want to talk about how you need to be. And he really focuses his attention on how Timothy is to respond to these increasingly dark days. And and let me summarize it very briefly this way. Paul says, the past is like the present. We're going to see that in verses 10 and 11. The future will be like the past. That's verses 12 and 13. So continue in the present as you have in the past in order to engage the future. All right? So he ties it all in here. He's looking back at what has happened. He's looking ahead at what will happen. And he's saying, the only thing you can affect is the present. We can't live in the past. We can't live in the future. So what you do now is important. But what we do now has a connection to the past. And it's being done in anticipation of the future. So they do all come together. To borrow from another of Paul's letters, uh, in Ephesians chapter 6, where Paul is talking about the spiritual warfare that we're a part of, he says this, beginning in verse 10, Be strong in the Lord... And in his mighty power, put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand. That's a real key phrase here. Take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the whole armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, there it is again, and after you've done everything, to stand. Three times in those few verses, Paul talks about standing firm. Our goal in the warfare that we're a part of, the spiritual battle that we're in, we want to be able to stand at the end of the day. 
We're not always going to be, you know, soaring on the clouds. If you can stand your ground, you're doing good. And that's what Paul tells Timothy here in 2 Timothy chapter 3 as well. I think this should be the goal of all of us. We want to stand firm, especially in these last days. And Paul gives Timothy three things to keep in mind in order to do that. First, he says, remember the situation that you're in. Look at verse 10. You, however, know all about my teaching, my way of life, my purpose, faith, patience, love, endurance, persecutions, and sufferings, what kind of things happened to me in Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra, and the persecutions I endured. Now, in the previous verses, he'd been talking about the phony lives and so-called ministries of the false teachers. Paul now issues a very emphatic call to Timothy to remember his life, remember his way of living. He grabbed Timothy's attention with a very emphatic use of the pronoun you. He's saying, in effect, false teachers and other evil people behave this way, but you... Timothy, you're going to be different because you are different. Don't be like everybody else. Don't follow the crowd. doesn't matter if everybody else is doing it. You are different. You need to stand out. Now, this phrase, you, however, know all about my teaching, really doesn't capture all that Paul is saying here. The, the Greek verb he uses means to follow as an example. So this isn't just a matter of I'm watching, I'm observing, I'm kind of seeing what's going on. No, I am following. I am using that life as a pattern for my own. So as Paul is moving through life, Timothy is following right behind him. I remember a story heard many years ago about a man who uh, he liked to frequent the local bar at night. You know, once the dinner was done and dishes cleared and kids get put to bed, he, he would go down to the local bar. And one winter night, as he's making his usual trek, he hears footsteps behind him in the snow. And he turns around and he sees his little boy has gotten out of bed. And he's jumping to get from one footprint in the snow. And his dad stops and, and the boy comes up to him. He says, son, what are you doing? You need to be in bed. And the little boy says, dad, I want to be just like you. And that made him think about where he was going. <laughs> and he picked up his son and turned around and walked back home. Whether we know it or not, people are following us. People are watching. And Paul says, Timothy, You've been following me for a long time. You've been my disciple. I've been your mentor. You know what kind of life that I'm living. Paul had issued a challenge in 1 Corinthians 11.1. 1, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. You think about that. That's a scary proposition, isn't it? You know, if you're telling other people, hey, you follow me and I'll get you where you need to go, you'd better get them where they need to go, right? Because you don't want to lead somebody into the wrong direction or to a wrong destination. Yeah, but that, that says a lot when we're telling people, you need to follow me. But the truth is, people are following us whether we want them to or not. And whether we're leading them in the right direction or not, they're following us, so we'd better make sure that our life is worth following. Paul's doctrine and his conduct was something of an example that Timothy was to follow. And the word here is not so much of a student in a classroom, it's more like an apprentice on the job. You know what an apprentice does, right? An apprentice watches the master as they work, and then the master slowly lets him do more and more until he learns that skill and he's able to do it himself. 
That's really what a disciple is. We talk about being a disciple of Jesus. That's not just learning a book. That's not just going to class and filling our minds full of information. It's life skills. It's learning to live like Jesus, not just know about him. And that's exactly the wording that Paul is using here for Timothy. Being a disciple of Jesus Christ is not primarily the product of a classroom. It's a life invested and shared through personal relationships. It's not just gathering data. (laughs) It's using it. It's putting it into practice. It's living the life. Now, you have to know the information before you can put it into practice. I'm not saying we shouldn't be learning. I'm saying we shouldn't stop at learning. Our learning needs to be translated into living. And for Paul, it was. And he's telling Timothy, you know all about this. Remember the path I have set for you to follow. Because there's going to be a lot of other paths. There's going to be a lot of other options out there. You remember what you have seen in my life. And Paul's way of life backed up his messages. He didn't preach sacrifice but then live in luxury. He gave others far more than he received from them. He stood up for the truth, even if that meant losing friends or, in the end, losing his life. In short, Paul was a servant. He wasn't a celebrity. And he's telling Timothy, I'm not calling you to be a celebrity either. You need to be a servant, a servant of Christ and a servant of others. And he outlines these various virtues His way of life, his purpose, faith, patience, love, and endurance. Now, we might say, okay, Paul, you're kind of bragging here. No, he's not. These are facts. He's saying, you remember my life. You remember the example I set, because I'm not going to be around much longer to give it. So you remember, you remember how I lived, and you follow in those footsteps. Then he moves on to talk about the persecutions. And he specifically mentions Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra. Lystra was Timothy's hometown. These are the cities to which the letter of Galatians was written. Because that whole region was called Galatia. These were the first churches that Paul and Barnabas founded on their first missionary journey. But all didn't go well there. (laughs) In fact, uh, he got run out on a rail in Antioch, he just missed getting stoned in Iconium, and he was stoned in Lystra. And I don't mean that the way we talk about getting stoned today either. I mean, these were real rocks, okay? They left him for dead. And Timothy was an eyewitness. He was there. That's his hometown. He was probably there when they drug him out to the edge of town and threw him in a ditch, figuring he was dead. But Paul wasn't dead. He got up. He went back into town. And then he said, understand that the way to, the way to heaven is not an easy one. <laughs> so Paul lived it. He had that endurance, which is something Paul's going to emphasize because that's what Timothy's going to need. That's what we all need. As times get worse, we need that endurance. We need to hang on. To our faith, don't don't give up the ship, so to speak, even when times get tough. And that's not all the persecution Paul faced. Remember, he was uh, illegally arrested and beaten in Philippi. He was run out of town in Thessalonica. He was falsely accused in Jerusalem of bringing a Gentile into the temple. They tried to lynch him right there. If it hadn't been for the Romans stepping in, he probably would have been killed then. And then to save his life, he had to appeal his case to Caesar, and he was in jail somewhere around four years awaiting that hearing. Just through the process of time, he sat in Caesarea in prison for two years, he sat in Rome in house arrest for a couple of years. So this was Paul's life. And it wasn't an easy one. It wasn't a glamorous one. Some people have this idea that if you're a preacher or a missionary or an evangelist, you know, wow, you get all this 
popularity and you know you, you know and especially if you see some of the folks on TV and they've got you know lifestyles of the rich and famous um, th that's not real ministry th that's not what the true servant of Jesus encounters because Jesus didn't encounter that himself it's tough but again, Paul doesn't leave on a, a negative note. He says in verse 11, yet the Lord rescued me from all of them. And then he gives one of those statements that we really wish we wouldn't read when we're reading in the New Testament. <laughs> Do you really have to say that? Paul says in verse 12, in fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, while evil men and imposters will go from being bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. Oh, man. I, you know, a lot of us think, when I come to Christ, my life's supposed to get easy, right? You know, all my problems are supposed to go away. No. If anything, it gets a little more challenging. Jesus never offered an easy life. There isn't anything easy about being a Christian. It's just better. A whole lot better. So if we confuse comfort with Christianity, we're going to be disappointed. You're going to be misunderstood. You're going to be mistreated. You're going to be maligned. You're going to be hated. Count on it. It's going to happen. And if it doesn't happen, hmm, are we really living the Christian life? Now, you look at our situation you know, in our nation, it's a lot easier to be a Christian here than it is in a lot of places around the world. All right. And that doesn't necessarily mean that we're doing something wrong. I'm not sure it's going to stay that way here forever. It probably won't. But understand that living the Christian life is not a guarantee of easy street. It's not. If it's a guarantee of anything, it's, a, it's going to be tough. And you've got to be tough if you're going to survive. You need to get a thick skin. That's not only for people in ministry like Timothy and Paul. That's true for all of us. Because if we want to follow Jesus, even Jesus himself said, you will be persecuted. Why is that? It's because godliness arouses the antagonism of the worldly. They won't admit it. But people outside of Christ, when they see true Christianity, they see the love, the joy, the peace, the self-control, those kinds of things, they're really envious. Now, they're not going to admit that because then that means that you're right and they're never going to let you know that. <laughs> but that bugs them. That gets under their skin. That's really irritating. You ever been around someone that's so happy all the time they're just maddening? <laughs> that's the idea. So, Jesus says in John 15, beginning in verse 18, If the world hates you, know that it hated me first. If you were of the world, the world would love its own, but because you are not of this world, I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, no servant is greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they're going to persecute you. When we are in the world but not of the world, there's going to be resistance. When we're truly following Christ, it's not going to be easy. But remember, remember those who have gone before. Remember the people in your own life. Maybe it's your parents. Maybe it's a Sunday school teacher or a pastor. Maybe it's a friend. Somebody that you looked up to. You wanted to be like them. Remember their life. Remember their example. Because if we only focus on what's going on around us, we're not going to have a good option when choices have to be made. Then he moves on in verse 14, remain on the source, verse 14, but as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of because you know those from whom you learned it and how from infancy you have known the holy scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation 
through faith in Christ Jesus. He's to go on believing and doing what he's learned from his earliest days. Remember at the beginning of this letter, Paul commended Timothy's mother and grandmother, Lois and Eunice, because they raised Timothy in the scriptures. We would say he was brought up in church, okay? He went to Sunday school. He learned the stories. He learned the scriptures. He says here, from infancy. You stay with that. Not everything that's new and improved really is. And when it comes to our faith, we don't need new and improved. We need the old and ignored. (laughs) We need to stay with the truth of God's word. You remain on that source. You you stick with it. Stay, Stay on the truth. And notice, he didn't just learn it, he's become convinced of it. This is more than just information in the mind. This gets into the will. This gets into our decision making. We're convinced this is the truth. This isn't just something nice to know. This is how we live. When we're confronted with a decision on doing something right or wrong, how are we going to choose? And if we use God's word, the truth we become convinced of, It's going to affect the choices that we make. And Paul refers to the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. This may come as a surprise to some, but we're not saved by knowing the Bible. Satan knows the Bible. Satan quoted the Bible when he was tempting Jesus. Satan knows, but he's not saved. The Word of God leads us to salvation. Because it isn't the Bible that saves us, it's Jesus. Now, the Bible tells us about Jesus, but it's not the Bible that saves. But you know, and I, I got to admit, there have been times in my life, I think I got caught up this too, we sometimes treat the Bible almost like a good luck charm. You know, well, I always got to carry my Bible with me. And I think when, when, when I was in junior high and high school, you know, well, if you carry your Bible to school, make sure your Bible's always on top. You know, it's, it's got to be above everything else. And okay, I get that, but, but we can almost get to where we think that the pages itself are holy and, and you know, this is, as long as I have my Bible, I'm, I'm good. It's not holding the Bible that is going to get you anywhere it's how much of the bible is in here how much of the bible am i living not whether i'm carrying the book or not um you know some people oh never mark in your bible because this is holy okay the pages aren't the truth in it is all right so so let's not go too far to the extreme of thinking that you know this is my rabbit's foot this is my good luck charm as long as i have my bible with me satan can't get to me oh yeah you can and he'll use your bible against you if you're not careful but these are the scriptures that lead us to jesus and it's the same word of god that hasn't changed throughout all the centuries I know people out there saying, ah, the Bible's been changed. No, it hasn't. This is the same Bible. This is the same truth. This is what we need to remain on. And then following up on that, Paul says, rely on the Scriptures. Verse 16 and 17. All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, training in righteousness, so the man of God can be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Chuck Swindoll writes concerning this passage, it is the single most significant sentence in all the New Testament regarding the scriptures because it touches on the watershed issue of faith for our times. What you believe about the Bible influences everything you believe and it affects every decision you make. Is this just a book that was written by a bunch of men a long time ago? If so, I can take it or leave it. But if this is what it claims to be, the inspired word of God that does not change, this isn't just true information, this is the truth, then it changes my life. 
Now, it says that Scripture is God-breathed, literally the breath of God. It's very similar to how man was created. Remember, God formed Adam from the dust of the ground, and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. That's kind of the idea here. God breathed out his word. Now, the way he did it is amazing. He actually breathed into these various people down throughout time. Did you know that the Bible was written by 40-some different individuals over 1,500 years? That's a long period of time. But it's the same God who breathed into them, and when they wrote, they were writing the very words of God. Now, the amazing thing is, God did not override their personalities. When you go through the writings, Paul has a very different style than Peter, who's very different than John and James, and you know, back in the Old Testament, Moses and David and, and all of them. God still used their personalities and their styles, but everything they wrote is God's truth. So it is truly the Word of God. Now what does he mean here by all Scripture? Well, at that time, all they had was the Old Testament, what we call the Old Testament. And I think that's very important because there are a lot of people that go around saying, you know, oh, you know, we don't need the Old Testament. That's the law. We're under grace and all that kind of stuff. Excuse me. This is the timeless word of God, all of it. And there is none of it that is more important or more inspired or more relevant than any other part. All of it is God's word. We got to quit carving it up and saying, well, we can follow this, but this we don't need. All scripture is God breathed. And that's what Paul said, not just me. All Scripture. But I think that Paul may be referring to more than just that. Now, nowhere in the New Testament does Paul say, my books are Scripture. But he does reflect the idea that his message is the Word of God. He says in 1 Corinthians 2.13, he uses words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit. So even Paul recognized that God was using him in a very important way. Peter, in his letter, refers to Paul's letters along with the Old Testament as other scriptures. So even then they were recognizing that God was still at work. The Gospels of the life of Jesus, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They're referred to as Scripture. So it's not just the Old Testament, it's not just the New Testament, the whole Bible is God's Word, and it is inspired. Peter describes how it was done in 2 Peter 1, 20 and 21. Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation, meaning they didn't just dream it up themselves. Oh, I'm going to write the Scripture today. But it says, Prophecy never had its origin in the will of men, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. This is truly the Word of God. And needs to be understood as such. And it's profitable for four things. Teaching, that's the information we need, tells us what is right. Rebuking, tells us what's not right. (laughs) Correcting, how to get right. And training in righteousness, how to stay right. It's informative, but it's also very practical. It tells us what's wrong, but it also tells us what's right. It is useful in so many ways. And it doesn't just contain truth, it is truth. It is the standard by which we can judge all things. And it's not merely academic. Paul goes on in verse uh, 17 to say, so that the people of God can be thoroughly equipped for every good work. The scriptures equip us to do what God wants us to do. Not just to know, but to do. And really, that's the bottom line, is how we live it. So how do you want to be remembered? 
Do you want your legacy to be as a follower of Christ who is able to stand firm in these terrible times during the last days? One who is able to stand your ground and after you've done everything to stand? Is that how you want to be remembered? One who is standing firm? Remember the situation. We are in a spiritual battle. We should expect antagonism from the other side. Remain on the source. We don't need new and improved. You stay with the scriptures we've always had and rely on those scriptures, that God-breathed revelation that tells us about God, tells us about ourselves, and tells us how we are to believe and how we are to behave. That's how we can stand firm with whatever we experience in this thing we call life. Would you bow with me as we close in prayer? Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have given us your word. You have inspired these scriptures that have stood the test of time. Beyond cultural and historical eras, it still applies because it's truth. And your spirit can still use your word to equip us, to enlighten us, to enable us to live for you, even as times are getting worse and worse. I pray for all of us that we could stand firm in the storms of life, throughout the battles we face, not with other human beings. Our battle is against the forces of darkness. Help us to stand as children of the light, firmly on the truth of your word. I pray that you would help us think on these things as we go from this place and show us how it can change our lives. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.